What about Call of Duty Mobile? You forgot COD Mobile. Just play COD Mobile. You should cover COD Mobile. Can you review COD Mobile? COD Mobile? Okay. But she didn't specify which one. The N-Gage is an oddly underappreciated little machine. In all likelihood, neither you nor anyone you know owned an N-Gage back in the day, and until all this recent coverage, you probably forgot about it entirely. The N-Gage failed for a wide range of good reasons. It was effectively the first game console cell phone hybrid, but wasn't really good at either task. The device felt like Nokia designed a cell phone first, then figured out how to make it work as a game console after the fact. The screen is straight off of any other Nokia of the time, and is thus the wrong aspect ratio for playing most games. The buttons weren't really great either. The D-pad was fine, but the keypad buttons were bunched up and had a fair bit of resistance, not really meant for rapid or precise inputs. And infamously, Nokia's mindset was stuck so firmly in the cell phone market that switching games meant removing the battery to access the cartridge slot as if it were a SIM card. When the N-Gage hit store shelves, the mobile phone side of things were already looking a bit dated. Sure, the system may have been incredibly powerful, but in terms of cell phone features one would expect, it was relatively light. And not even the QD facelift later that year could save it. Danger had already released the hip top a year prior, also known as the T-Mobile Sidekick, featuring a larger screen of an aspect ratio more suitable for gaming, as well as a form factor that would have made a lot more sense for a gaming device. Sure, the hip top didn't really play games, but it was a good cell phone first and foremost, and as it turns out, people would rather have two very good devices than one mediocre one. However, while the N-Gage failed to impress in terms of hardware, features, or sex appeal, it did have one undeniable W on its scorecard. The games. The system was honestly pretty damn powerful, more so than the GBA. And I suspect that if it had the same third-party support as the GBA or even other Symbian-based phones, it might have ended up with the best versions of quite a few games. Of course, that didn't happen, but the system did get a fair number of really impressive ports and exclusives alike. Splinter Cell, Tony Hawk, and even the Elder Scrolls came to the platform in its short time on the market. But perhaps most surprisingly, years before its explosion in popularity, before it even went to consoles, Call of Duty got its very own port to the Nokia N-Gage, making this the first handheld Call of Duty game ever released. Now, I've played a lot of Call of Duty spin-offs, nearly all of them actually. Some were passable, some were disappointing, and worst of all, some were infuriatingly lazy. Call of Duty for N-Gage is not that last one. This version was a real, genuine try at converting the game to mobile. The developer, Omegasoft, honestly did a pretty decent job downsizing the game for the hardware. Especially given that from what I can tell, this is the only video game they ever made. Unlike the Java Phone version of Call of Duty, this was a true adaptation of the original, an actual first-person shooter on a cell phone in 2003. The game's shooting, movement, and objective mechanics are completely intact, and it's all rendered in real 3D. The only sprites I can spot are the guns, and while animation may be choppy, they're surprisingly detailed for a mobile game of that era. While I may be impressed that this is running on a cell phone from 2003, that doesn't make it much easier to look at. God, my eyes actually need a break. Let's look at something a bit prettier. Ah, much better. A big thanks to today's sponsor, Fishing Clash, a free-to-play fishing game for both Android and iOS. In Fishing Clash, you can catch hundreds of unique species of fish in over a dozen scenic fisheries. Fish for sport in player versus player tournaments and championships, participate in weekly events, or just fish for fun whenever you've got a second. All the while, you'll be collecting an arsenal of fishing rods, lures, and other gear that can be upgraded, so you can catch even bigger fish. From the Yangtze to the Nile, for the folks at 10 Square Games have created what might be the most detailed versions of these fisheries in any video game ever, so you'll have no shortage of things to gawk at. You can download Fishing Clash for free from the link in the description today, and if you do so, you'll be helping out the channel directly. Sound design is pretty impressive, too. The voiceover honestly sounds better than the ones on offer in the DS games and it's even accompanied by something resembling in-engine cutscenes. Oh, for God's sake, Jack! It's the biggest forest in Normandy! Pay attention! 
it still looks like a symbiont game, and the frame rate does chug, but damn it, this is Call of Duty 1 in your pocket. It's an ambitious little game. But uh, just like that, I am out of positive things to say about Call of Duty for the Engage. I won't beat around the bush. This is one of the higher effort games in Call of Duty's long history of weird ports and spin-offs, but it is still unquestionably the worst game out of all of them. Yes, even Final Fronts. Information about Omegasoft is really, really scarce, and from what I can tell, this is the only game they ever made. And their lack of experience shows. I wasn't lying when I said it's impressive for a mobile game. None of this game's problems are the N-Gage's fault. No, no, Call of Duty for the N-Gage is bad solely because it was poorly designed. While this game is fully 3D, it plays a lot like Doom, and like in Doom, there was verticality in some of the levels. But crucially, in Doom, you don't pitch the camera up and down. Your character shoots at the enemy on the center of the X-axis, regardless of their vertical position. This means a pretty decent translation to Super Nintendo and Game Boy Advance, which, like the N-Gage, aren't designed for first-person camera control. Call of Duty, on the other hand, relies on the same precision aim as its PC source material. But because this is your controller, aiming isn't exactly the snappiest thing in the world. The D-pad handles movement as well as left and right aiming, but for pitching up and down, you'll have to use the 2 and 8 keys. Now, I emulated this game, and played with a Nintendo Switch Pro Controller mapped to your typical Call of Duty layout. But in my experience, aiming up and down was an incredibly sluggish, imprecise process. And having previously owned and played a real N-Gage, I can't imagine this would have been any better on real hardware. Now, there are quite a few problems with this, each of which builds on the next. Problem number one. Most enemies are total bullet sponges, taking as many as 6 out of 8 rounds from M1 Grand to go down. They also have incredibly strict hitboxes, so you will need to be precise. Problem number two. Enemies have absolutely inhuman reaction times, and since dropping them requires dumping almost an entire magazine, you will take unavoidable damage in nearly every encounter. But whatever, right? Call of Duty 1 is probably the slowest paced game in the franchise. It makes sense that it would incentivize staying in cover and taking enemies down from a distance. <sighs> Which brings me to problem number three. The draw distance in this game is about five feet. Okay, well, it's a cell phone game. What do you expect, right? Problem number four. Enemies shoot at you from beyond the edge of said draw distance. What the fuck killed me? Right, let's save right here in case this becomes a theme. Oh, that. You know, the enemy you can't see because of the fucking drop distance. Jesus Christ. Because this is the original Call of Duty, there is no regenerating health. But there also aren't enough health kits relative to how much damage you'll likely take. If you're low on health, you have a matter of frames to react and kill an enemy before you're met with a game over screen. Sometimes, they shoot you before you even round the corner. Did I mention this is normal difficulty? Not veteran, not even hardened. This is the second easiest mode in the game. All of this culminates in an experience where basically every single encounter must be safe scum to progress. Not only to preserve anything resembling enjoyment, but to progress at all because there is no autosave other than at the beginning of levels. This means that Call of Duty for the N-Gage rapidly devolves into a frustrating series of trial and error coin flips. Either the AI misses, or you die. Otherwise, AI are similar to those in the DS games, in that they might have a waypoint to walk to, but will otherwise never move from their fixed location or do anything other than shoot at you. Something I realized after discovering an infinitely respawning enemy. You fucking joking? This is obviously not ideal, but at least at first it was tolerable. The American act of the game isn't that bad, to be honest. The levels are large enough and provide enough cover that I never had too much trouble. The draw distance in particular was a problem, but not insurmountable by any means. But things take a turn for the worse in the British campaign. 
I'm constantly made to use flat guns to destroy tanks that I can hear, but not see, for extended periods of time. By the time I reached the dam level, I was ready to quit. You infiltrate this dam by yourself, and navigate poorly lit, labyrinthine hallways, rife with 90 degree corners and enemies placed outside your very short range of visibility, or in some cases directly above you, where they're hard to see and even harder to aim at. And keep in mind, I'm playing on a 27-inch monitor, not the 2-inch screen on an actual N-Gage. It breaks pretty much every rule of classic FPS design, and instantaneous cheap deaths are constant. And once you finally reach what should be the end of the level, you must then backtrack all the way through it all over again, with more enemies spawning in your path. Oh, he's up there again. And I already know what at least a few of you are going to say. Whenever I criticize a game like this, I invariably get the same comment. What did you expect? It's a DS game, or a PS2 game, or in this case, an N-Gage game. And every single time, my response is the same. A game's platform does not preclude criticism. There are multitudes of excellent video games on pretty much every platform out there, N-Gage included. I've said in the past that when developing a DMake for limited hardware, designing for your platform is just as, if not more important, than respecting your source material. The N-Gage's limitations may not have helped matters, but personally, I think the blame rests mostly on Omegasoft. They commit enough game design faux pas on their own, like giving enemies inhuman reaction time, or making it so aiming at a hostile turns your crosshair green instead of red, which is just a baffling decision. There's no doubt in my mind that this game could have been much, much better, with some relatively minor tweaks to both the design and the balance. Enemy AI in the full version of Call of Duty have a short buffer between the time the player walks into their cone of vision and the time they react. The N-Gage version desperately needed the same, doubly so given the input method. Regenerating health would have been ideal, but at the very least, health kits should have been more common. And enemies should not have been able to attack from outside the draw distance. Full stop. Call of Duty's J2ME phone games are far from exceptional, but they're at least functional. The N-Gage game may have the WoW factor in its corner, but once that wears off, there's nothing worth sticking around for. Given a choice between a visually identical game that plays like shit, and a unique game that deviates in ways that result in a better experience on the same hardware, the latter is almost always the better decision. But hey, if people took that sentiment to heart, I'd be out of a job. But there is one thing that N-Gage had that no other phone in 2003 could claim. Wireless Bluetooth multiplayer between multiple N-Gage phones. I'm fairly certain this is the first instance of Bluetooth multiplayer gaming, but unfortunately there's no way to play it in an emulator quite yet. And I don't even have one N-Gage anymore, much less two. If and when this becomes possible, I'll cover it, because it's too cool not to, but best I can tell, there's positively zero footage of this game with multiplayer out there. And unfortunately, that's not the only thing I can't show you. Call of Duty for N-Gage had downloadable content, on a cell phone, in 2003. For a small fee, users could log into N-Gage Arena and purchase three new levels for the game's single-player campaign. But N-Gage Arena is long gone, and for once, I don't have any tricks up my sleeve. And since the N-Gage was a commercial failure, those extra levels might actually be gone forever. And here is my cue to once again talk about preservation. Early mobile games are particularly hard to preserve, because the only way they could be acquired was by downloading them from the carrier. Once that carrier took the game off their store, or shut down their server, it was gone. Mobile game preservation relies on people who already downloaded games years ago to dump and preserve the likely tens of thousands of mobile games released for Java phones. The N-Gage is in a better spot than most, since its games are released on retail cartridges, but as possibly the earliest example of downloadable add-on content for mobile games, and being one of the worst-selling game consoles of all time, this content is at great risk of being lost forever. And that's if it isn't already too late. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you might be familiar with something I like to call The Pile, a list of games I've reviewed that are so irredeemably, inexcusably bad that they have no worthwhile qualities. And while I was playing this game, I truly thought I'd be adding it to the list. 
It's such a miserable game to play that I couldn't see myself ever finding the good in it again after that initial wow factor wore off. But as I write this review, I find myself so amused by its existence, I could never possibly damn it to that fate. Do I want to play it ever again? Hell no, but I have to admit there is novelty in the frustration that made me feel. The result of inexperienced developers squeezing a big budget first person shooter onto a cell phone on steroids. COD Engage was, for better or worse, a genuine attempt at navigating uncharted waters, and that is something I can respect, no matter the end result. And once again, a big thanks to Fishing Clash and Ten Square for the sponsorship. Thanks to these guys, I can feel comfortable and secure in both the show and my finances this month. So go give Fishing Clash a download from the link in the description. It's free to you, and it shows them that their support matters.